I'm delighted to say in the studio now the former England goalkeeper Chris Kirkland has popped in to see us. Chris, how are you? I'm good, very good, thank you. Thank you very much for coming in today, we appreciate it. Chris is uh, with us to open up about his secret addiction to painkillers, attempts to take his own life and the moment this year that led him to seek help. Chris, first of all, you wrote a massive article today with Henry Winter in The Times, which has just gone live on The Times website. How are you feeling and how are you managing the situation right now? Tell us why you wanted to speak out about it. I should have done this the, definitely the first time, definitely the second time when I went to rehab. That's the real reason uh, I went to work. I, I, I'll be honest, I feel as though I'm a bit of a fraud because people know I've struggled with mental health, but they don't know the real reason. Um, so that's why I'm coming out now saying it. To recover, to stay in recovery, I don't think you ever recover from something like this. So it's been over 10 years, uh, eight and a half years on them, off and on bits and bobs. But to stay in recovery, you need the truth out there. You need to be honest and... You need support. I thought I could do it on my own. My wife knew, obviously, the second time how bad it was, but sort of kept it all to myself. And you can't do it yourself. You can't beat it. You kid yourself. Oh, I'll stop. I'll stop next week. I'll be better. This is the last time. And it just it just comes back in. The addiction kicks in. So the more support you can have around you and uh, the better chance you've got of staying in recovery. Everybody has known that you've had um, issues with injury and you've had mental health issues before and you've been open about that. But it was quite stark reading the opening of that article this morning, which says you stood on the edge of a roof when you were on pre-season with Berry in Portugal, eight floors on top of an apartment block. And at that point, you were about to step off. Why did it get so bad? Because the tablets messed me up. They just, you know, in the end, they don't work. They don't do what they're meant to do. They change you as a person. They, you know, I withdrew. I didn't want to do anything didn't lost interest in everything just didn't just a different person um you know now people say we've got the old kirky back and but i just didn't want to i just didn't want to live i just i was in that much pain with the painkillers not with you know the back's always been an issue but it's been manageable um but with the painkillers what they were doing to me mentally was uh, i just had enough and as i said yeah it was about two o'clock in the morning i just went out i was on the top floor stood on the roof and i, ju- I was just going to jump but I, I felt a pull back and you know, I know no one was there, but it, I know it was my wife and my daughter. And that's when I rang her, rang the owner straight away. Then at two o'clock in the morning, I said, "Look, I've got a big problem with painkillers. I need, I need to, you know, need help." And she said, "Right, come straight back." So we made some excuse to come back from Berry, from Portugal. Got home, told the PFA, got off them the first time. Berry were magnificent. Dave Flickcroft was superb. He'd been through similar stuff, not with painkillers, but with mental health. Um, it obviously didn't know it was the painkillers that were doing it. thought it was my, my mental health, which it was, but through the painkillers. Got off them, and then for about 18, about a year, I and then I started to miss the routine of being a footballer. I started to miss having a purpose to get up, miss you know, the dressing room, and went back on them stupidly. Um, and then it was 2019, I was on, like it was tramadol, I was on, Two and a half thousand milligrams a day. Now I don't know. You're supposed to take four hundred milligrams a day, a day yeah. maximum, and yeah. you were taking two thousand five hundred. What yeah. was that doing to you? Well, I mean, it nearly killed me a few times. I was hallucinating. I I remember certain nights that I forgot who I was. I was violently ill, violently sick. Um, again, just didn't want to do anything at all. Didn't answer my phone. Didn't text messages. But you know, you, and then after them incidents, you think, right, you've got to stop. I'm going to die. So I'd stop for three or four days, but then your body would be in bits because you're addicted and, and the withdrawal symptoms are just as bad as, as what you're going through. Um, so you go back on them. And I did. And then I I just said to Leona again the second time, look, I've, I've got a big problem again. She says, right, you need to go away now. You, you've got to go to rehab. And I totally agreed with her because I knew I wouldn't be here anymore if I didn't. So I rang the PFA, obviously, as you do as a former player, but unfortunately, the, the waiting list was, was too long to get into sporting chance. I think it was about three months. I said, listen, I ain't got three months. I said, I've not got three days. So uh, we just got on the internet, me and Leona, and she says, right, let's find a place for you now. I don't like being away from home. So the thought of going down there anyway was, was daunting because I'm, obviously I'm from Liverpool. And we found, we found Parkland Place in, in North Wales, and I rang them and said, look, I'm addicted to painkillers. I'm a former footballer. Um, can you get me in? And they said, yeah, you can come in today if you want. So I went down the day after because I had a few bits to sort out, packed my bags and went down to rehab on the Monday and started three weeks in there, which was tough, really tough. Um, you're in there with other people, obviously addicted to cocaine, alcohol, gambling. 
but it's you know you, you're sort of in a bubble there but what they tell you when you're in there is you need to set things up when you come out because mm. as soon as you come out there it's, it's it's when you're in there it's like it's not real it is but it's not and, we, and we'll talk about that in, in a, bit. In, in a yeah. bit because we've got Leon coming on Leon Marsh who's the director of the hospital and residential care at uh, Parkland but you wanted to ask yeah. a quick question yeah, just in terms of uh, this issue with um, addiction in football, um, obviously you, you bravely are bringing it to the party now. I'd imagine there'll be a lot of current and ex-players possibly going through the, the same situation that you were. Do you think it is a, a bigger problem in football than we know about? Because obviously you managed to hide it from teammates and managers, I would imagine. Do you think there's yeah. other people out there doing the same? Without a doubt, yeah. But listen, I, I, wanna, I didn't do this to... To, to highlight that you know I did it for society as well not just football listen I know football everything but there's a massive problem in society we know the, the epidemic that was in, in America um, but yeah in England and definitely within football listen I've, I've spoke to a couple on the way down that have rang us today and you know we, we talked about that it, that it was it was a norm you got pain painkillers you got anti-inflammatories you know I don't know what it's like now because obviously I've been, out, I've been out of football for a while but listen these players you know, a lot of them are on appearance money to play. No, I'm not all about in the Premier League because they they get enough money. But League One, League Two, where they've got to pay mortgages and stuff, it's got to be happening. It's got to be happening. But listen, I'm not going to stand here and and slaughter clubs. It's for the clubs to do their own internal investigation because listen, I got them from outside of football. You know, where so did you get them from? GPs, internet, every, everywhere I could. Um, again, I'm you know certain people. I'm not going to mention names or anything like that. But not their fault. They had no idea. Um, but I'm not going to. As I said, the, the, I'd be amazed if... I know there is, because I know I've spoke to players, but I'm not... It's for the football clubs to sort themselves. But like I said, I got them outside of football, so football clubs have maybe got to start testing in-house. They've got to do some of it because it, it's so easy. And it's not just, you know, it's alcohol, not, it's everything. Are these not on the banned list? These are not- I got drug tested how many times and I was on them. And, you know, particularly when I was at Sheffield Wednesday... Um, Because that's when it started. I wasn't on before that. I took them a couple of times when I was at Wigan around 2010. Didn't have a problem. Just used them for the reason then. But it was 2012 because I started using them for the anxiety of travelling away from home. I missed my routine, missed picking my daughter up from school. You know, I'd gone from 11 years having the same routine, being at Wigan, Liverpool, 15 minutes from home to travelling, etc. But two days before the first game of Sheffield Wednesday, I I was actually fit and everyone was saying, what are they signing for? The last two years at Wigan, I just wasn't preferred. I wasn't playing. I wasn't mm. picked by the manager. So I was fit. And But then ironically, two days before my first game of Sheffield, I got a back injury and there was a clause in the contract that said, if he misses three games, which in the Championship, it could be Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, they could rip the deal up. And I thought, if I don't play Saturday, I'm going to get crucified. Everyone's going to say, look, told you so. So I got hold of some. But they not only helped with the pain, but they helped with the anxiety of travelling away from home and stuff like that. And at first, you kid yourself, say, well, I'll just take them when I go over to Sheffield, do this. I won't take them then, but then it becomes more and more and more. Chris, what do you think the tipping point is from from using the painkillers for what they're supposed to be used for to then becoming addicted to it's obviously very easy for that to happen but what do you think the tipping point was for you uh you know you know, i mean i knew after about six months i was becoming dependent on them um because you feel when you're not on them you, you, your body feels it's achy it's you know you get the sweats and, and you think can't be that surely but then it is yeah. you, you know it is um but it, it but then you hide it like i said with, with you know with addiction you you're sneaky you're you hide it. You you tell people lies um, because it is an addiction. It takes control of your of your life, and not just mine. I mean, listen, it was extremely tough for me. But my wife, my daughter, you know, they basically didn't have a dad or a husband for 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 years. I was there, but I wasn't really there. So my wife is, you know, Leona. She what she's done. I mean, when I went through the withdrawals five months ago, I, I was curled up in my bed for six seven days, couldn't move. I was in agony, sweating, being sick. She, you know, she was checking I was still breathing all night, and and you know, so she's, you know, she's been through it as well. And and I'm, I'm thankful that I've had her because without, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here now without a shadow of a doubt. And you mentioned in the article as well that uh, she drug tests you every week to make I've got sure. drug tests. Yes, this is what we should have done. The set, the, the what, what Park and Place advised, um, I didn't do because probably thought I'm, I'm gonna I'll have a few months off and then, I'll, and then I'll get back on them but then obviously lockdown here I couldn't get treatment on my back etc and listen we all have a choice and I made the wrong stupid choice again but yeah this time we've put things in place so we've got the drug test at home she can test me anytime um you know I've got people know now people I work with know so all my friends know so there's no there's no and I feel free 
I do. I you're lucky free. that you've got that strong support mechanism mm. around you because, as you say, with, without it, when people didn't know, you would quickly move back into the, the similar scenario and relapse. But now, yeah. you know... Well, that's like, why I knew I had to. Because, again, I... I listen, did she give I'm, you an ultimatum? Then? No, 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 she didn't. No, she just said, listen, you know, we want you... We don't want you to die. Lucy, obviously, she's 15 now. She's older. You know, it all make kids are clever. They know. But I just didn't... I just had to... I knew I, I knew what I needed to do to to uh, listen. I can't sit here and say I'll never do it again because you can never say never, mm. you know. But I hope now I've got the things in place to to prevent me. Okay, and one of the reasons that you've got those things in place is because you went to work. I uh, will work do some work on yourself at Parkland Place, and the director of hospital and residential services, Leon Marsh, is going to come and talk about what the therapies they offer uh, there and 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 how it sort of worked between the two of you and what successful steps were taken uh, to put you on the road to recovery. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.